I'm joined in studio with Robin Lohr and Will Jimmy of Nistanan. I'm pretty sure I'm pronouncing that correctly. So this is an Indigenous-led group, and it's working towards expanding, I guess, the utility corridor or exportability to Hudson's Bay. Uh, have I got that correctly, essentially, in a nutshell? Yes, you do. Okay. And, so yeah. Nistanan, yeah. for those, and I don't speak Cree, but Nistanan, for those that don't, means all of us in Cree or in some parts of uh, Cree-speaking world, us too. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and what's uh, interesting right off the, the bat with that is that the, it clearly it's, it's a partnership initiative. It's not talking about uh, negotiating an agreement with uh, First Nations on the way through. It's partnering with First Nations and actually uh, getting together on that. I mean, it, it's surprising it kind of took this long and this many fights with uh, infrastructure projects, but uh, working together is the way, uh, probably a better way to get things done, I would I think it's uh, the whole concept is not new. It was talked about back in the 70s, even the, the 60s by, uh, by the Indigenous leadership at the time. But I think what has happened is that, uh, you know, the, the will uh, and the expertise uh, and the willingness to step forward and take, take, pick up the ball and run with it wasn't there. And I think uh, over the years, the transformation of uh, Indigenous leadership uh, has, uh, has created the opportunity for, for us as First Nations or Indigenous people to pick up that ball and run with it and become a, uh, a part of the Canadian economy. Yeah, well, and, and it's the, acti the active nature of it that's good. I mean, it's not just, okay, we've come to an agreement, here's your monthly royalty and we'll carry on. I mean, right. it's participation, it's, it's being within the, the agreement, I think that would lead to a more productive relationship theoretically. Sure, mm -hmm. I would uh, say for the economy and for the indigenous mm -hmm. participation, it's transformational. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess getting onto what this particular project is, so, I mean, we've had a lot of bottlenecks with getting a lot of product to uh, coastal waters. I mean, energy has been the prime one, but this is talking about a lot of products actually besides just energy products. But can you kind of lay out uh, what, what's being proposed, like the route to get to, to the coast on this? Well, we're, you know, we're, we're product agnostic and uh, the University of Calgary School of Public Policy has done some really good work on this and saying Canada needs more multimodal transportation systems. So uh, the vision is a indigenous owned corridor inside that can go all sorts of things, be it power lines, fiber optics, rail lines, pipelines, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. all yeah. of those things. So would this be uh, going in and supplementing the existing rail line that's already going to Churchill or is this a whole new corridor you're talking about? The, the if I may, yeah, Go ahead. the corridor in itself would be something uh, new that uh, that would be developed from northern Alberta through northern Saskatchewan, northern Manitoba into the uh, Hudson Bay. Uh, the rail line itself has been there for 100 years. Uh, it was known as the Hudson Bay Rail Line at one point. Now, uh, now it's the One North Rail Line, which is uh, owned 100% uh, by the by the nations and the and the municipalities in northern Manitoba. Okay, so this would be a, a whole new line potentially going to it? Or well, it would be a collaboration with that. Okay. With so, that, and mm -hmm. uh, we're not uh, not interested in going to a lot of effort to replace something that already exists. That's so what I'm be, kind of wondering. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we've heard that this line, it's a tough one to maintain. It's covering a lot of skig and, uh, uh, you know, so soft areas, uh, permafrost, things like that, and, and it needs some upgrading, I imagine. Yes, it does. Uh, the line from the pod to Amory, Manitoba, uh, I think would uh, would suffice with uh, you know some maintenance on it, upgrades. The the line that goes from Amory up to Churchill is the one that's Muskegee, and uh, the ground conditions are not favorable to hauling uh, heavy loads on on the rail line. Okay, so that that, that different line has more ability to. Yeah, the the uh, uh, Canadian government and the Manitoba government have. Uh, uh, put forward $147 million to improve all of that. Mm. Okay, so, so that's a work, work in progress. Uh, so the kind of products that would go on that, I imagine things, I mean, we've had a lot of uh, supply chain issues. I think the more means you have to move product in and out, it, it's going to be better for the nation as a whole. But uh, I think initially agriculturally or fertilizer, things like that, I would, would be prime type of... Well, well oh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, potash is, is front and center. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a simple thing to move. And uh, Canada has half of the world's potash reserves. It's a very necessary fertilizer to grow food. And uh, Belarus and Russia are the other two big producers. And they're mostly off the market. So it, it's a problem for the world. 
uh, we think that that could be exported out of the Hudson's Bay uh, through the indigenous uh, ownership pretty pretty expediently. Okay. And likewise, it, I mean, I imagine, as you said, you're agnostic with it. Anything could go, but there's things you could see along the lines, like uh, forest products, for example, uh, that could be a potentially good area. It's, it's an inert product. You don't have an environmental hazard in moving that. Uh, it can be stored uh, at a port uh, for uh, seasonal reasons, and, right. and uh, but also help the communities that are developing their forestry uh, industries where they are along the uh, right of way. Would be it. Well, that's a we we were meeting with uh, uh, Lac La Ronge's business group last week. They're a big forestry operator in northern Saskatchewan, and and your points are points are correct. Uh, in exporting stuff to the U.S., we end up with uh, tariff and royalty issues and protests about subsidization of the Canadian business. That's not a problem heading to Europe. Mm -hmm. And again, Hudson's Bay is close to Europe. So speaking of Hudson's Bay, though, it, you do have a limited shipping window when you're in there. It's, it's not like some of the other deep water ports on the east and west coast. So how much time is it viable to, to uh, bring product in? In there. Well, you know, when you compare Churchill, uh, the port of Churchill, uh, as it sits today, it's uh, uh, in fresh water and uh, it uh, freezes solid in the winter months, uh, probably six to seven months it's, it's frozen. So you got five months of shipping time. We looked at the uh, uh, port of uh, Port Nelson, which is south of uh, Churchill, and that's located in salt water on Hudson Bay. And uh, although there's ice in the wintertime, but it's more like slush, a meter of uh, slushy ice. And uh, that's why we kind of thought, well, maybe we should, um, you know, uh, investigate the, uh, the option of putting a, a port in Port Nelson, where the original site was 100 years ago, prior to them moving it north to Churchill. Okay, well, and I'll, I'll just expand on sure. that. We're, we're not inventing anything here. Mm -hmm. The Russians do all of this in way tougher conditions. I think it is important to have a, a year-round shipping port there. So that's a work in progress and uh, uh, discussion with the uh, existing port of, uh, at Churchill and, uh, and the owners and who are, as Will said, are, are mostly indigenous. And so we're not, uh, this isn't a them and us program. This is a collaboration. Yeah. And then what about for bringing product in? Uh, you know, that, that, that's another aspect. I mean, I, I could imagine you could be uh, bringing import products into this port to, for distribution. Uh, I mean, Winnipeg is a good transportation hub for uh, intermodal, intermodal transport, things like that. Uh, are you been looking at uh, overseas partnerships, that sort of thing? We haven't been looking at overseas partnerships as of yet, but what we've looked at is actually uh, having a container port as well as part of uh, phase one and uh, uh, along with the potash. That way we can get the containers in there, uh, ship them and uh, rail them uh, into uh, the Winnipeg, where they have the uh, transportation hub. Okay, yeah, because I mean, just it would be quite an economic boon. I mean, when we're bringing product now right into the center of the nation geographically, yep. uh, rather than to our east and west coasts and, and still having to ship inwards. Likewise, I, I imagine there's potential to ship downwards into the Midwest and, and the United States. For that. Yeah, it, I mean, the opportunities, there's a bit of a build it and they will come uh, uh, opportunity here. Uh, Containers are how a lot of things get moved. Uh, a center port, uh, which is a Winnipeg promoted phenomena that uh, needs a deep water port, a tidewater port, and this could be a great marriage with it to service the middle of uh, North America. Winnipeg's the geographical center of uh, North America. And you mentioned deep water, so that that is a good. It, it can sustain some some larger uh, ships and things such as that. Like I, I spent a few years working up in Inuvik, for example, in mm -hmm. Tuktoyaktuk, like their ports. But due to the nature of the delta and the ice, it, it's just not right. an appropriate area for heavy shipping. But. Sure, it uh, you know liken it to the Gulf Coast of the U.S. Uh, we would need to do some dredging. We think that's a engineering work in progress. Uh, dredging is why. The original port, as as Will mentioned, was moved to Churchill from uh, Port Nelson. Uh, dredging was a big problem in uh, 1920, not not a big deal in 2022. Yeah, so we've got better ability to dredge silt builds up, and it causes uh, issues. But are there environmental challenges then with that? I I, I, I mean, I was, you know, looking at some of the areas where you could get uh, pushback from some groups or people saying that if you're disrupting things along the coast, is, is that, I imagine there's mitigation plans. Yeah, you know, what we've done uh, is uh, actually uh, get uh, the, the two nations uh, that are right on the, on the coast uh, involved. 
and they've been spearheading the whole environmental and social impact studies um, because they, it's their backyard. They and, don't want to mess. Yeah, yeah. and uh, they, they've taken the ball and uh, they've, uh, they've uh, hired their own, uh, they've got their two scientists that are actually from, from their nation uh, that are working, in, and one is a professor in the university, the other one works for, for an organization in Winnipeg. And they're from the communities, they've got their doctorate degrees, uh, one in environmental science and the other one in the social uh, impact uh, studies. So they're going to take the ball and roll, uh, run with it. And uh, what better way to, uh, to have successful um, uh, endeavor with your own people leading the charge, because it's their backyard, they know the trap lines, etc. And, and uh, they know the, uh, the movement of the, the wildlife as well. Yeah, I mean, they're going to know what's going on and they're the most impacted. Yeah. So it's good to, you know, seeing that working ahead of that rather than working after the fact and then getting yeah. into a fight. Is a, and I think, uh, yeah, I think that's going to uh, to uh, alleviate a lot of uh, unnecessary uh, setbacks uh, that uh, like pushbacks, et cetera. So uh, the, another area with challenges, it sounds interesting with the, the federal government, as you said, has already put a lot of money into upgrading the line. So, I mean, they, they're certainly receptive to some degree of expanding the capacity then, or they wouldn't have gone in. Uh, is there already communications with other levels of government? I mean, that, that's always one of the areas you can kind of get tied up in red tape. And even with the best of intentions, uh, things can get uh, hung up for a long time. Can I can I quote you on you could get tied up in red tape? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. Corey, Corey uh, we... Uh, we've uh, built a good relationship with uh, the government of Manitoba in this process and are in regular contact with them, uh, less so with uh, Saskatchewan and Alberta, but uh, we are in contact with members of cabinet in both governments. Uh, it's, it's something that's got to be done. Uh, this being an Indigenous-driven and Indigenous-owned project, uh, it's a they have powers under the constitution and under their treaties that a typical industry player doesn't. Well, I was going to come to that in a mm -hmm. sense. I mean, that kind of transcends It's a, like a whole other order of government or level of it. I mean, it doesn't give complete impunity to push a project through, True. but it certainly gives a, a different type of leverage when speaking with the federal government or, or speaking uh, in, in, I mean, you're going to mm -hmm. cross a number of jurisdictions if this sort of project comes along. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. all, all true. It's, uh, the vision is across the prairies and the northern prairies, uh, so that it'll be virtually all crown land, uh, ex current crown land that will be transformed to indigenous land through treaty land entitlements and other existing mechanisms with uh, between the governments and the uh, indigenous people. Yeah, so if you did do a corridor, uh a full corridor with a number of utilities, then, I mean, how wide would you be looking for a right of way? Like, uh, you know, a pipeline right of way can range anywhere from 50 meters to uh, 150. Uh, you know, I, I guess if you have overhead power, if you have pipes, if you have rail, uh, is it a wide footprint? Or? Uh, well, we this one will be measured in kilometers, not meters. Okay. So it'll be one, two or three kilometers, depending on, on, on the part. It's got to fit uh, a number of things. You know, one of them being a large uh, direct current power line. Currently, Manitoba Hydro is uh, uh, selling power to the U.S. at less than two cents a kilowatt hour. You can finance that existing line into Alberta if you could get permission to build it, mm. which indigenous groups think they can uh, with the diff with that spread in the power. Which, again, I mean... The, the you know, if, if I don't want to get too far into the weeds on the whole thing of renewable energy and so on, but hydro generated power is, is a green type of energy. It's emissions free and it would fit with a lot of net zero plans. If you could bring that sort of generation then out to the West and into Alberta and other areas where yes. you wouldn't have to. Well, and as one of the Manitoba cabinet ministers said that water is going down the Nelson river, whether we turn it into electricity for use and, and it's green use. Yeah, I mean, it's not like the water vanishes when you put a hydroelectric down. You're going to hold it up for a bit, make some juice, and the water can carry yeah. on where it was going. Yeah, well, That's great. So at what stage is, is, is your group at at this point? Uh, you know, is, is it uh, fundraising, consultation? I imagine there's a number of uh, irons you got in the fire with this. Yeah, what, uh, what we're doing now, I, we thought it was very important to actually engage the uh, communities along the potential corridor, um, just so that we avoid uh, unnecessary setbacks. And, uh, you know, the last uh, year and a half or so, we've been visiting the communities, uh, making presentation, consulting with them, and uh, basically uh, getting their, uh, 
their support in uh, in this endeavor. And uh, it has gone successfully to date. Uh, all along the road, we've uh, we've had uh, no setbacks in terms of pushback. Uh, a lot of good questions, mind you. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, uh, a lot of the nations that we've spoken to thus far have uh, uh, expressed their support on a project like this. And it's still a bit high level. What sort of timeline are, are, are you looking at then at this point where you think perhaps product could actually be moving or even construction, I guess, moving on, on this, this right away? Well, the, you know, the, the world need for this type of project in Canada is yesterday. Or as, you know, as one of the professors that looked at it said, well, we needed this 25 years ago. All of that's true, but we didn't build it 25 years ago. So the question is how soon can we move it through? And to background to some of your questions, uh, the largest uh, time consuming thing here is the regulatory process and the consultation process. We've focused on the consultation process because it's indigenous owned and we want not just a chief and council to think this is a good idea. We want the community. The grassroots think, people, yeah. which represents the, the nation to uh, buy into this and to give their approval. And, and we've, we've gotten those, uh, those, those support. Uh, it seems to be uh, uh, a long, a long uh, it would appear to be a long process, but I think it's the right process. Yeah, well, you can get hold of if you don't do it correctly. I think if in Calgary, for example, with the ring road, I mean, they, they, often they got approval from the chief and council, but when they put it to the people on the ground, they said, no, we don't like this exactly. deal, and, and they rejected yeah. it. Exactly. And years were lost if yeah. they started at the bottom. Yes. And to work your way up, uh, yeah. that road could have been done a long time ago. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's good to see a more proactive approach with something like this, yeah. because if people don't feel they've been spoken with and respected, that they're not going to cooperate later on. Yeah. And I think that's that's where all the uh, setbacks with other projects have have arisen, is that uh, the grassroots people weren't uh, weren't properly consulted. And as a result, uh, were, you know, uh, uh, felt that they were they were being wronged. But I think with our process, we're going to, to the grassroots people, explaining to them, listening to their concerns and uh, agreeing with their concerns and uh, putting our minds together and saying, yeah, but we can do it in this fashion where it uh, mitigates and minimizes the, the impacts. Well, it sounds like a, a very exciting initiative. If you know, mm -hmm. I was presuming it can come together. I really you know, like where it's going. Where, where can people, uh, I mean, I appreciate you coming in to speak to us. If, yeah. if there's more you'd like to add and, and where can people find more information about this? Well, uh, there's a website, uh, eastanand.ca. Uh, it, uh, it's put together by us amateurs, so don't mm -hmm. be too... Yeah. Well, don't, I've, I've looked at it. It's got <laughs> some good videos and, depth and, and things, of course, to it. So I yeah, just like to yeah. you know, be able to remind people while they're at it, is this you know, where they can find some more if they've uh, caught uh, interest. We can only cover so much in the show. Yeah. And, and perhaps they'd have things they'd want to send your way for you know, uh, feedback or whatnot. So. Yeah, we'd, and we'd welcome that. Yeah, we, we think it's the right thing to do at a whole bunch of levels. Uh, it's interesting uh, talking to international groups that are potential partners and, and funders. Uh, there's a real doubt out there internationally that Canada could actually ever approve a big project. Well, that, that is a concern. I mean, we, we've tried a number of large capital uh, projects and they've been kind of stopped in their tracks and, yeah. and it does make investors get a little shy with things. But the uh, Indigenous element's always been a large part of that. So if, if you're partnering with the, the Indigenous communities, then right. I, I imagine a lot of that can be rectified. Well, <laughs> yeah, and, and yeah. more than partnering, they're, they're owners. Yes, you yes. Know, it's, it's, it's a better way to put it. Yeah, yeah. And, and, yeah. and I think that the big difference is uh, not just partnering with them, but they're, uh, you know, we, we as Indigenous people are, are leading and, and taking the ball and uh, running with this uh, big infrastructure project. Oh, excellent. Well, thank you both very much for, for coming in today. It, it just really sounds like a, a great initiative. I, I hope to see more progress on it. Maybe we'll check in again uh, down the road a little and see, see how it's coming along. Yes. Love to. Thanks yeah. for your interest. All right. Thanks. We'll okay. talk again soon, guys. Okay. Thank you. The current Lethbridge feed grain prices are as follows. Cash barley is unchanged at $4.55, feed wheat remains at $4.78, and corn is down $4 at $465 per ton. In the milling wheat markets, December Minneapolis futures are down 8 and 3 quarter cents at $9.29 per bushel, with local hard red spring bid for December movement at $12.20 per bushel. 
In the oil seats, nearby canola futures added $1.50 at $893 per ton, with delivered values for December at $20.02 per bushel. In the pulse markets, nearby red lentil prices remain at $0.33.5 cents per pound, and yellow peas are sitting at $13 per bushel. In the cattle markets, December live cattle gained $0.30 cents at $151.87.5 per hundredweight. For more information on pricing and picked up on-farm options, give me a call at 403-394-1711. I'm David Lee at Marketplace Commodities. Accurate real-time marketing information and pricing options. Canadian Shooting Sports Association. Without the CSSA, our gun rights would have been taken long, long ago. These guys are on the front lines uh, helping to draft smart and intelligent firearms regulations and legislation in Canada. And more importantly, educating the public about how we keep guns out of the hands of the wrong people. To become a member, it's absolutely worth every penny. You can become a Western Standard member for just $10 a month or $99 a year for unlimited access.